there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Britain's a small island with an extraordinary past and amazing landscapes. But what we see above ground is only half the story. I'm travelling the length and breadth of our country to see it from a whole new perspective. Underground. I'm Rob Bell and I'm on a subterranean mission. I'm exploring the mysteries and wonders that lie right under our feet. You've got to make yourself as small as possible. From man-made to natural wonders. There's just so much to take in here. Many are forgotten corners from the darkest points in history. There's a real presence down here. This is an adventure of those places beneath the surface. A journey through underground Britain. This time, I'm in Scotland. I'm discovering the wonders it holds beneath the soil. Oh, it's already quite tight. <laughs> I'm climbing into an Ice Age world that time forgot. Inch your way through. Discovering how power comes from deep inside a mountain. It feels like you're in the middle of James Bond villain's lair. <laughs> and sliding into a vast man-made cavern that helped win World War II. <laughs> There's not much room to maneuver here. My journey begins on the northeast coast and a place with a deep and dark story. It has an intriguing name, the Sculptor's Cave. The rocky shores near Elgin are home to windswept cliffs and remote sandy bays. It's an area rich in human history, good and bad. I've come here to visit a cave that's revealed quite chilling secrets from throughout the ages. It's said to have been a place that for thousands of years witnessed rituals and burials. So I've come to try and find out more and see if I can get to the bottom of exactly what went on down there. But first things first, I've got to get right down there. And it's 30 meters at the bottom of these cliffs. Ooh, that's steep. And at high tide, there's no easy access. The only way down is by rope. Oh, it's no easy start to this, is there? It's uh, straight onto the cliff. Yep, we're off. Good, it's a great way to access caves. Oh. Oh, that feels good. Whew. Back down on the old terra firma. Oh, it's quite some entrance. That's what I'm looking for. Tucked away in the dark shadows under the cliff. This here is Sculptor's Cave. And even on a sunny day like this, it's all hidden away underneath in the shadows of the cliffs here. So it's got quite a gloomy, dark, and a bit chilly kind of feeling to it, just constantly. But if you come over here, uh, yeah, have a look up here. This is why it's called Sculptor's Cave, because on the left, you've got three ovals that are carved in, and then to the right, what's apparently carved in the shape of a flower. Now, these are almost instantly recognizable to experts as being from one of the most mysterious and enigmatic peoples that ever lived on British shores, the Picts. The Picts were not one, but probably several ancient tribes which lived all along the eastern coast of Scotland. They were a renowned and impressive culture, but to this day, very little detail is actually known about them. These symbols have been dated to around 600 AD, but their exact meaning remained a mystery. Some believe that they were a warning to others to keep out of here. But 
what was so threatening about the sculptor's cave? The curious symbols prompted one bold archaeologist, Sylvia Benton, to start excavating at the back of the caves, 25 metres from the entrance, in the 1920s. And what she found there shocked her to the core. Professor Ian Armit has been following in the archaeologist's footsteps. When Sylvia Benton, the first excavator, um, started working in the cave, she was finding uh, lots of evidence for um, fairly precious objects. Elaborate gold-covered hair rings, bronze pins, that kind of thing. The type of jewellery was about 3,000 years old from the Bronze Age, hidden here 1,500 years before the pigs carved their symbols. But shiny stuff wasn't all the archaeologists uncovered. They also found human remains. Lots of them. But the most extraordinary uh, finds really were at least about 2,000 human bones that were found scattered around the deposits inside the cave. Most of these bones, or at least a large proportion of them, uh, belong to children. Um, so you've got children's bodies being disposed of within the cave itself. And the children's skeletons revealed a shocking surprise. Their skulls were missing. Some oddities amongst those bones in that, for example, there were very few uh, cranial fragments, fragments in the skull represented. So it seems that parts of the bodies were being taken away or, or removed or different activities were happening with them. Sylvia Benton was completely baffled. She had no idea where the children's skulls had been taken or why. That question wouldn't be answered for at least another 50 years. In the 1970s, there was another excavation in the cave by Ian Shepherd, and he excavated in the entrance areas. He did find skull remains, and he found skull remains of, of young children between around the ages of about six and nine. Which um, matched the same ages of the children that were found? Same sort of the... ages, yeah, yeah. And he found in particular mandibles, uh, the remains of the lower jaw, which seemed to have, you know, um, fallen from the skull and become incorporated in the archaeological deposits as they built up. Ian Shepherd had the brainwave that these children's heads had been deliberately removed from their bodies after death and were hung up around the entrance of the cave. But why? I tracked the bones down to the Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. This is one that was found at the front of the cave then? Yes, this was found at the entrance to the cave. On some of the skull fragments, scientists have found tiny telltale scuff marks. This is evidence of polishing or abrasion, and it may have been to remove flesh from this child's skull as part of processing of the head for display. Wow. As weird as it sounds, these children's heads were being severed from their bodies after death, skinned and hung up like decorations. Tiny gold hair rings found with the skulls are probably an added decoration. That's been remarkably well preserved. They were probably adorning the children's heads at the entrance to the cave. These heads were being groomed, they were being prepared, and they were being looked after for display purposes. Today, this practice seems alien and gruesomely appalling. But was it seen the same way 3,000 years ago when it happened? This isn't a disrespectful act. This is something quite important, quite emotional. Homage to the dead, really. It's odd you know, you use that word respectful. And, and for us, for, well, for me at least, you know, to have your head chopped off after you've died, that doesn't, for me, seem respectful, but this is a completely different era. It's already clear that the sculptor's cave is a gateway to a very different time. But the children's bones aren't the only skeletons here. This was also a site of execution. I'm exploring underground Scotland. Here in the Sculptor's Cave, I've discovered a place of mysterious symbols and the bones of long-dead children. This is a cave of the dead. In many parts of the world and in many parts of history, caves have been seen as places where you sort of communicate with the underworld, the sort of entrances to other worlds. So it, it, it makes sense in a way that, that that's where you put your dead. You put them in a place that's, that's in an entrance, if you like, to the spirit world or the underworld. Part of that is marking the entrance, marking that kind of gateway from the world of the living to the world of the dead.
There's a real presence down here. But there's another, even more gruesome twist to this intriguing place. It's not only children's bones that have been found here. Adult bones have been unearthed too, and they reveal a dark story. Once again, the necks have been severed. These vertebrae, which display evidence of cut marks, which were always assumed to be late Bronze Age, um, actually these cut marks look like they were done with an iron blade, an iron weapon. These adult bones were radiocarbon dated to 300 AD, over a thousand years after the headless children's skeletons and in a time of iron weaponry, which explains the clean cut marks. These are the, the first and second vertebrae of the neck. So we're yes. talking about decapitation once again? Uh, we are, we are. And unlike the children's skulls, the cut marks on the adult bones reveal an ancient story of bloody execution. This vertebra here actually has um, up to 11 cut marks on it. The angle of the cut marks suggests that the individuals would have been in a kneeling position with their chins onto their chests. And certainly in the case of this individual, they'd have had to have been held in place, certainly after the first blow. It's amazing. I mean, this is, this is kind of like forensics putting together the evidence for a murder case now, you know, looking at all the evidence that we've got and being meticulous with absolutely every detail. The evidence reveals a grim story that several Iron Age adults were killed here 1,700 years ago. The character of the activity in the cave seems to have changed quite markedly once we get into the Iron Age because um, the vertebrae would suggest that we're actually seeing you know, a, a significant number of people being executed in the cave, being decapitated. So probably down, down on their knees, don't you think? That's right. The first cut would have killed, even if the head didn't come off, the person would be dead. Okay. So someone's supporting that body to enable the second two or three chops to go in. So really, more than one person involved in the execution and, and a very formalised process for person after person. Wow, I mean, that's <laughs> freaky just being down there in a cave on my knees. I'm going to get back up. It must have been a bloodbath. But why did it happen? It appears that quite a number of people were executed possibly at one time. So you're looking probably at a, you know, a big political or religious or act or both on a significant scale. When these executions happened, Scotland was separated from what's now England by Hadrian's Wall. The Romans considered everyone living here to the north of the wall to be barbarians. The people executed here could have been tribesmen, deliberately slaughtered by their rivals in this symbolic and ominous place, where centuries earlier, children's bodies had been placed and their skulls displayed. Two distinct periods, a thousand years apart, but yet there's, there's something obviously quite spiritual or, or special about these caves. Given that we know that Sylvia Benton found a place strewn with human bone, undoubtedly at the time when these executions were carried out, the place would have been strewn with human bone as well. So you'd have been in no doubt that this was a place of the dead even then. This was such an important place. Yeah, that's and right. And everybody would know that. This really is an amazing underground cemetery. Eerie carvings marking the spot where two very different types of decapitation happened separated by a thousand years. It's another world that will be hard to shake out of my memory for a very long time. The next stage of my journey through underground Scotland brings me forward over one and a half thousand years to the modern day. I've come in search of hidden power. Just look at that, there's some view. The Scottish wilderness with mountaintops as far as the eye can see. It's a beautiful, picture-perfect natural landscape. Or so it may seem, because this lake behind me is in fact entirely man-made. I've come halfway up Ben Cruachan Mountain to an artificial reservoir designed to trap up to 10 million cubic meters of rainwater. But the water here isn't for drinking. This is stored power. A good 400 metres beneath me, 
past the dam and into the mountain itself lies one of Scotland's most fascinating engineering achievements. This is the home of instant energy, 24-7. Built in the 1950s, the huge Kraken construction project hid a whole power station inside the mountain. by Her Majesty the Queen. It was state-of-the-art technology. Even the Queen came to open it. To get to the heart of how this place works, we're driving deep into the mountain. So this is your uh, this is your commute to work. Yeah, it is. Down, down into the station. It's get get busy down here sometimes. Is it traffic nightmare? We're uh, kilometres down down deep inside uh, Ben Cruachan itself. The tunnel itself was dug by guys who were known as the Tunnel Tigers. The majority came from Donegal in Ireland, and uh, they would come specifically to, to excavate the tunnel, so it was all manual labour. So they would have what, been spending most of their time underground in this, yeah, in this mountain? Yeah, really hard physical labour. No kidding. Just uh, digging out these tunnels. This tunnel alone took a year to complete. Over a 1,000 men drilled and blasted their way through 220,000 cubic metres of granite. This is it, it, right in the heart of the mountain. Brilliant. Oh, hang on. Oh, wow. Oh, Ross, this face, it's just enormous. The power station itself is housed inside this gigantic man-made cavern. Over 90 metres long, it's the length of a football pitch. Almost feels like you're in the middle of James Bond villain's lair. Yeah. It's enormous. It much further down as well, so there's four different levels. And all of it's dug out by hand. All dug out by hand. It's so huge. Over 50 years after it was built, it's easy to forget this place exists, hidden away up here in the mountains. But these four generators have been not so quietly getting on with producing electricity for all over Britain ever since. So the water's rushing through these pipes here into those turbines. Yeah. When the water's released from the reservoir above, it rushes down huge pipes to the underground power station where it turns gigantic rotors inside the turbines. With all four turbines working, this power station is capable of generating 440 megawatts of electricity, enough to power a city the size of Edinburgh. But what's really special about this place is that it was built to help solve a major power supply problem, coping when there's extreme need on the national grid. All right, Rob, so this is it. This is a central control room for, for Crook and Power Station. This is where everything happens. This is the brains behind the operations. This is, it. This is uh, Kevin Roy. He's one of our, our engineers on the How you Kevin? How you doing? Good to meet you. This is great. And you can control and monitor everything from your seat here, Correct. the seat of power. From this ordinary-looking control room in the heart of the mountainside, the demand for electricity on the grid is constantly monitored. Kevin, talk me through what have we got here. Sure. We have each unit, we have four units as you're aware of. Yeah. We have Kraken 1, Kraken 2, 3 and 4. Uh-huh. Our energy management are requiring Kraken unit 2 on at 4 o'clock. Whenever there's a massive surge in demand for electricity, say when everyone puts the kettle on in the advert break for this programme, the national grid turns to Kraken for a much-needed boost. What looks like a couple of minutes' time, we're going to need to hoik up from zero to 120 megawatts off unit wow. two. Great. Hang on. What's, what's that? So that noise we've just heard there is the five-minute warning. And you get a five-minute warning from National Grid? Yes. And a phone call as well? That phone call isn't from National Grid. OK, fine. Good. National Grid contact us here on the... On green the green phone. phone. On the green phone. I love that. On the green, the special green phone. It's only got one line. Absolutely. Kruachan to National Grid. Kruachan is the vital safety net in the system. This place stops the lights going out and keeps your TV on. When that goes to 58, 30, yeah. we'll get you to initiate the start button. 
The first person to switch the power on in 1959 was the Queen. Two, one, boom, boom. Oh, there it is. With a tiny click, I've just released 200 tons of water per second into the generators. Of course, you can't see any of that raging torrent because it's all sealed away in massive pipes, but you can certainly hear it. it feels like an earthquake or you can feel it underneath your feet as well. That is 120 megawatts of power flowing right under our feet here. And it's that fantastic acceleration going from zero to bone shaking full power that's crucial. Coal and nuclear power stations can take up to 30 minutes to get going, but Kruachen leaves them standing. It takes us about two minutes to go from rest up to full load to get the machines on to, to generate. And if you think of the amount of water and the force of the water that you've got to get to drive that turbine, it's phenomenal. And you can do that on something that heavy and that massive in two minutes. In two minutes. And can the grid need electricity that quickly yeah. sometimes? So if you think about things like tea time peaks or areas of when there's really high demand... Like half-time uh, football match, that kind of thing. That kind of thing. We can be there, we can come on really quickly to respond to that. But perhaps the cleverest thing about this power station is what happens at night. When we're all in bed asleep, not really using much electricity, there's still power on the grid. This place can use that power efficiently to drive the turbines in the opposite direction, effectively working as a pump, pumping the water back from the locks below, through the power station and up into the reservoir. Being able to store the energy for those times we need it the most is a really self-sufficient solution to giving us power when we need it. It was surprisingly ahead of its time, and it's still bailing us out of trouble every single day. Next, I'm going deep. Really got to just oh, you almost through through. to discover a land that time forgot. Welcome to the Bone Caves. Hidden in Scotland's longest caves. Scottish subterranean investigation is in the Northwest Highlands. I'm heading for the mysterious bone caves. They lie deep down Scotland's longest cave system. Hidden inside, clues reveal the mighty beasts that once roamed the land. Above ground, this is a fantastic wilderness of steep mountains and monumental valleys. I've come here in search of a land that time forgot. The highlands are never the warmest of places, but compared to a few thousand years ago, this is practically tropical. In fact, this whole landscape would have been shaped by a far colder period in Scotland's history, the Ice Ages. The secret to what happened here in the Ice Ages lies inside the mountains, in an immense and famously challenging cave system. The Grampian Speleological Group have been exploring these caves since the 90s. Now's the time, is it? Now's the time. Their leader, Ivan Young, is going to take me down into the depths to get to the bone caves. Still here at the top here now. It's quite hard to imagine what goes beyond what the eye can see at the moment. Okay. Apparently, this ominous looking hole in the ground is the easy way in. <laughs> Straight down, yeah? Straight down. <laughs> OK, we're good to go. Yeah? Off you go. There we go. Oh, it's already quite tight. <laughs> oh, it's actually quite far down. OK, Rob, follow me down. It gets a bit more complicated further in, but you're okay down here. Amazingly, this isn't a natural break in the rock, but a man-made shaft, painstakingly dug out by Ivan and his team. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. How far down are we here? 
We're about 14 metres from the top. 14 metres, and you guys dug all of that? Just about all of it. There was only a little bit of air at the top before we started digging out all the muck. How long did it take you to dig all this? Well, we started digging in 95, and it wasn't until 12 years later in 2007 we actually got dug through into dry passage. It took you 12 years to dig all this? Cavers have long known there was a massive cave system down here, but exploring them involved diving through tight, water-filled sumps. But those early divers had already made an amazing discovery deep in the system, bones. Now they needed to dig this dry route in. That 12-year that period was almost an investment in the future to be able to go and explore the rest of the caves much easier. It's a of real course. adventure. After my first long descent, I've only scratched the surface. The vast network stretches on and on. This is actually a lot more hardcore than I thought it would be. You come on down. So far down. <sighs> so where next? Right. Along here, through the tight spot behind. Through there? Through that crawl. The next challenge lying between us and the bone caves is the toughest yet. A tight passage called the Skyway. Go on, you first. I'll, uh, I'll follow your technique. Look at you. This is, this is just an all day in the office for you, isn't it? Yeah. This is, this is hands and knees stuff here. Yeah. Oh, it is, yeah. I've been caving before but I've never been anywhere as daunting or as remote as these caves. This is really tight <laughs> and wet. <laughs> oh, it's only a puddle, though. So it's like a full-blown torrent. We're a two-hour drive away from Inverness and 16 miles from the nearest village. <laughs> Just a little bit further. Then you can stand up. Put all my faith in Ivan. He's been down here loads of times. There it is. Oh, wow. Oh, it's quite humbling, really. It feels like there's a lot of rubble, these boulders. I mean, where have these boulders come from? Uh, I don't want to uh, frighten you at all, but most of them have fallen off the roof. Finally, we've made it to our destination, in the belly of the cave system. Welcome to the Bone Caves. This is where amazing discoveries have been made about the beasts that once made these caves their home. So what kind of bones have you found down here, then, Ivan? Well, the most amazing set we found on the second trip. That's five of us went diving, and I went off in a different direction to the other four and discovered a couple of long bones from legs. Femurs, there's a femur that's about that length. So that's kind of human size, isn't it? Yeah, it was up just about that, but we hadn't lost any members down there, so we knew it wasn't that. Met up with the others, brought them back, and we found more bones, bones and then more bones. Until it was obvious most of a skeleton was there. One of us was joking that all we need to do now is find a skull, and John, who was in the far corner, said, <clears throat> excuse me, guys, behind this boulder, The bones were taken carefully all the way out through the caves and sent to the Museum of Scotland to find out exactly what they were. Andrew Kitchener, a specialist in prehistoric animals, examined them. So this is the um, skeleton that Ivan and his team found. And as you can see, it's something quite special. I bet you couldn't believe your luck when all this came up. Well, it was extraordinary, although we did know it was underground for an awful long time, 12 years from the first photographs until we actually got the, the whole skeleton up. It's, yeah, totally tantalising. <laughs> I bet it was. That's amazing. It's so complete. There's, there's almost the whole thing. A little bit's missing there, but... Yeah. You can see that the bones are very chunky and they're actually quite heavy. Do you want to feel that? Yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that is completely solid. I thought that was going to be really, really fragile. Yeah, he was a big boy. So if you compare that to me, it's, it's about the same size, but yeah. the bone itself is... The muscles on that would have been massive. Yeah. This is the skeleton of a brown bear. They haven't existed in this country for at least a thousand years. But when Andrew examined it, he discovered this one is much, much older. 
We've had him radiocarbon dated, and he was about 28 and a half thousand years old. Really? And it's still this complete and in, and in this good condition? Yeah. 28 and a half thousand years old. That means the bear was living here in a milder period during the early stage of the last ice age. It's thought it came into the cave to hibernate through an old entrance and was literally caught napping. Ice covered the land and a rockfall sealed the cave, preserving the bones for thousands of years. And you guys were the first people ever to set your eyes on it. That's right, we were, yes. They've just been lying there ever since it had died in the cave. That's amazing. Brown bear down in these caves. And so that was one of the reasons why we wanted to dig down and get a nice dry entrance so we could actually take the bones out. The cavers had turned up one of the most important discoveries in Scottish archaeology. But Andrew has uncovered an even more fearsome beast. There was another bear that was found in the 1920s there, which people thought was a cave bear to begin with, and then they thought it was a brown bear. But when we had it radiocarbon dated, it was exactly 20,000 years old, which means it was there slap bang in the middle of the last ice age. So we know it was a polar bear. So that was a polar bear? So it's Scotland's only polar bear. It's amazing to think that polar bears roamed the Scottish Highlands at the height of the last ice age. And it's only now, thanks to modern radiocarbon dating, that scientists have been able to prove what these creatures were and when they lived here. So all of these discoveries, carbon dating them, allows you then to go back and start filling in pieces of this timeline Absolutely, as to yeah. what the climates were at different periods. You had brown bears, then polar bear, mm -hmm. and then brown bears again. That's right. So all these are pieces of a, a jigsaw in, in putting this bear together, but then pieces in a much bigger jigsaw of that timeline. Yeah, an environmental jigsaw. You can look back in time to see how the environment changed. The finds in the cave enable us to pinpoint accurately when changes occurred in this landscape and discover the fabulous creatures which roamed through the ice ages. There are bound to be many more bones down here, hidden away in this vast network of caves, just waiting to tell their story. I can see how Ivan and his boys keep coming back. It's addictive, and I'm kind of hooked myself. Coming up! Now I'm moving east leaving the Ice Ages far behind to seek out a far more recent piece of Scotland's underground history, a subterranean giant which helped Britain triumph in World War II, Invergordon on the Cromarty Firth. This sheltered body of deep water has long been one of the most valuable anchorages in Britain. These days, the Firth is mainly full of cruise ships, bringing tourists to the area. But during the Second World War, this Firth would have been packed full of warships. It was a major base for the Royal Navy's fleet. I've come here to discover a highly secret installation that kept the Navy fighting at sea. Quietly tucked away, high up on the hillside, is a doorway. I'm told it's the forgotten entrance to what was one of the most hush-hush parts of Britain's defence plan. Archaeological investigator Alan Kilpatrick is helping me into the belly of the beast. This is it here, is Alan? This is the way in. <laughs> it's our only way in. Through this pipe. How wide is it? It's 18 inches wide. 18 inches wide. What's that foot and a half? It's my yeah. shoulders that are going to get the widest bit. You'll be fine. All you've got to do is get on that. What do we reckon, head first? I would definitely say feet first. You've done this, I presume, before, so I will oh, yes. definitely take your advice on that. Oh, feet yeah. off the end a bit. Absolutely. And what we'll do is we'll just lift you up. OK. Oh, 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 oh. oh that's tight. My shoulders are right up against it. <laughs> <laughs> There's not much room to manoeuvre here, even if I wanted to go somewhere. My nose is so close to the top here. 
It's totally unnerving. I can't tell how long this pipe is or what I'm going to pour out into. <laughs> this is very odd. You can't see a thing, but there's this stench of oil which just hits you. I think the only way we're going to get to see what this place is really like is to throw some big lights on it. I hope this works. Light them up! I'm exploring what was once a top secret part of Britain's World War II naval defences. I hope this works. Light them up! <laughs> That's enormous. The oil glistening on the floor and walls gives a clue to what this extraordinary place was for. It's a vast World War II fuel tank. Now we've got it lit up here, Alan, you get a sense of scale in here. It is just a vast complex. And this tank, it's just one of six in the complex. All up in this hillside here? All on this hillside. Uh, we're up to 120 metres below ground at this point. <laughs> Each one of these tanks, 237 metres long, you could fit a cathedral in here and have room to spare. It's a capacity of 100,000 tonnes of fuel oil. It's so hard to even envisage how much oil that actually is. Four miles uphill from Invergordon, the enormous tanks were built as reserves to store fuel for the warships. When needed, the oil would flow downhill to the ships waiting at the pier below. The ships were battling to keep Britannia ruling the waves, but they needed fuel, and that could only come here all the way from distant oil fields. But it's coming right round South Africa, up the coast of Africa, through the North Atlantic, round the north coast of Scotland, down through the Murray Firth and into the Cromarty Firth, where it finally is safe. To keep the Navy fighting, it was absolutely vital that these tanks were protected from attack. Having this oil here, then, I guess, was absolutely critical to the success of the Allied forces. It was. It was designed to be bombproof. That was the reason they had to bury the oil at, under the hills in structures like this to protect it from German bombing because if you haven't got oil supplies you can't move your ships if you can't move your ships the island's finished Britain is finished and the war is over and the Germans probably knew these oil reserves were here this aerial photograph from the time shows huge heaps of rubble that had been removed to build the tanks but even if they suspected what was going on there was very little the Germans could do about it reinforced with walls of concrete half a metre thick. Not even a direct hit could touch these tanks. And even more surprising is that while the Germans possibly knew the tanks were here, the locals didn't have a clue. Ewan McVicker's father was in charge of the site during the war. They knew there was something happening. But what it was and who was doing it particularly and what the purpose was, wasn't even people who are out here didn't know. My wife, who came from the farm next door, they knew there was something an inch and down, but what they were doing it for was not even explained to them. They could see something was going yeah, on. Yeah, and they find all this rock turning the side and people working in there, but what they were doing. All of this is just original 1940s see stuff. the side of the bulbs, yeah. Because this place has just been abandoned since... Yep, and, and locked off. And I'm, I'm the first time we had a chance to get in here at all. Brilliant. Because of the war, this complex had to be built in just three years. It was immensely difficult work, with constant danger from rockfalls and blasts. But the major killer was a silent one. Lots of the men in here would have died of silicosis. Silicosis, what's that? Inhaling... Inhaling the dust that's come off when you're taking the rock down and turned your lungs to stone, and that killed you. So I'm thankful my father came out safe and sound. Yeah. But so no many men wouldn't have. Hard, hard times down here. And no compensation. It was such a dangerous job. People working on secret projects like this at home contributed massively to the success of Britain during World War II. 
When it was up and running, these tanks supplied millions of tons of oil to power the ships used in many major wartime campaigns, including D-Day. This flask, which is the flask he carried with him throughout his work in life, and there's a drop of the hard stuff and the soft stuff, and I thought you and I could toast his memory and the memory of all the people who worked here. To all the people who worked down here. Thank you to all of them, after all these years. The Invergordon fuel tanks worked for decades beyond World War II, right through the Cold War and Falklands campaign. They were only decommissioned in 1982. These days, nearly all the oil is gone. The tanks have been lying here, empty and abandoned. But now one man has found a rather surprising use for them. Trevor Cox is a professor of acoustic engineering, and he's turned in for Gordon into a field laboratory. I'm going to time this, Trevor. Yeah, I think about it stopped. There? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. I was waiting for you to speak first. I didn't want to ruin <laughs> it. So that stopped at 50 seconds. I made that. Wow. I mean, not quite your record. What was your record that you got down here? It was 75 seconds. I used a slightly bigger gun, but I also measured according to a standard. But yeah, my recordings last for over a minute in this place. In January 2014, Trevor set the world record down here for the longest ever echo. Trevor, what is it about this place that makes it so special for echoes and sound? Well, the sand in this place just lasts a huge long time. And I'm kind of a bit used to that in a cathedral. If you go into Grand Cathedral, the sand will last, I don't know, 10 seconds before dying away. But this place, as well as being huge like a cathedral, is made out of the most massive concrete walls. They're half a metre thick. And they, and they were just put into the bedrock of Scotland. So as sand rattles around this, this place, there's, no, there's nowhere for it really to go. This record was set in 1970 and lasted a mere quarter of a minute. Down here, the echo was five times that. You must be a real hero amongst sound enthusiasts around the world. Everyone can't quite believe it. You know, when you ask them to guess what the reverberation time is, people come nowhere close because it's so long. And I don't think it's going to be a record quickly broken because such a big space with such massive construction, it's a really unusual place to be in. It is. It's even hard to have a conversation down here because it lasts forever and ever and ever and ever. And, ever. and now Trevor's going to attempt something rather unusual. This must be a first as well. I've always wanted to play an instrument in here and I'm a saxophonist, so I brought my alto sax along with me. The acoustics, I'm imagining, are going to be knockout. What do you think this is going to sound like? Well, it'll change across the instruments at low frequency. <laughs> It's like a fog horn going off into the yeah, night. The ship that goes out to the Cromarty Firth, yeah. It's going to last a long time. At high frequency, the air absorbs a little bit of sound at high frequency, so it tends to die away a bit quicker, that top note. And the thing you can do is you can build sound on top of each other, so you're going to... Just get a chord play along with myself. You get a whole chord. You could harmonise with yourself yeah. along that. But lower frequencies will last, so that bass, yeah, that bass sound will last, yeah. reverberating, and the melodies, I guess, on top, will be able to dance around on top of it. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, look, I'm going to let you play. I'm going to stand back and uh, hand it over. OK. It's all yours. Next time, I'm in London, exploring one of World War II's best kept secrets, dropping into the city's deepest ever tunnel. And I'll be descending among the dead.